All right, listeners, I am so excited to announce that the MLOps community has partnered up with Quantum Black, the AI branch of McKinsey & Company, to show you some of the incredible things that they're working on. And for the next couple moments, I brought on a partner from Quantum Black, Nair Khan, to come and talk to us a little bit about what they are doing and what they've been up to. All right, your official title, Nair, is partner, but your unofficial title is professional data nerd. I want to know exactly what is Quantum Black? I mean, look, if I go a little bit about our origins, we, we started off in Formula One. We realized very early on that we could use data and AI in very smart ways off the track to have big impact on track times. So then we took that same mentality of using data and AI in very smart ways to help companies across industries on some of their toughest AI use cases to really drive impact. And just as some examples, like that could be in sports and that could be, for example, team composition or injury prevention or even racing. Could be natural resources, for example, oil fields or energy production, optimization. Health and life sciences is a, is a big topic in terms of R&D of new molecules, but also optimizing clinical trials. So instead of 10 years, driving all the way down using data and AI to a fraction of the time. So we're about 2,000 colleagues globally. We've expanded now to over 40 countries. And when we talk about the kind of profiles we have is data science, data engineering, your standard ones, but also DevOps, software engineers, product design, SRE, cloud. So a whole football team of different technologists and, and, and skills to come together to really solve some of the top, toughest AI problems. And when you say football, you mean American football or are you talking it, it about? It be American football because I know you're an American football fan. So I'm, I'm okay with that. So how does Quantum Black approach scaling AI? I know you all are very, very deep in this subject. I think sometimes it's always distilled down to just technology, but it's more than that. And I would argue that it's people and process too, which is sometimes even more important. But because of your listeners, maybe I'll, I'll just talk on the tech first. One of the nice things with GB right now today is that we're technology agnostic. So our clients and the organization we work with, they have a myriad of different types of technologies that could be on premise or that could be on the cloud. But tech gets you only so far. So really it's helping organizations optimize the process of building AI and bringing this, this football team of talent I mentioned earlier, but also helping organizations build their own football team of talent. And trying to standardize and automate the process end to end, like removing the friction between teams. So in a really simple way, taking organizations that take maybe months and months to build something and put it into users' hands, but actually getting it down to days. That's the goal. One of the final points I'll just mention on this, like, and I think it's one of our really strongest value propositions and some things we, we really double down to, is actually building the right thing. So not, you know, building tech and then hoping the users will come, but actually really focusing on is this a problem? What is the problem we're trying to solve with AI and data? And then working our way backwards to what tech do we need? What data do we need? Talent, ways of working, et cetera, et cetera. Listeners, you all heard it here first. Quantum Black is partnering with the MLOps community. If you want to go deeper into anything that they are doing, we're going to leave a link in the description below for you to go down the rabbit hole. And also, they're always looking for incredible talent. So if you feel like you fit the bill, We'll leave an email for you to reach out and get in touch with them. Thank you for having me. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, my name is Duhin Srivastav. Um, I'm the, uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of Base 10. Um, that basically means I do a lot of you know, nothing and a little bit of everything. Um, and <laughs> the how I drink my coffee, I drink it black. Um, I, but, you know, a straight, like... I, I, I really enjoy coffee, so I, I would drink any form of coffee. Um, I like espresso, but you know, being in America long enough, you end up just drinking a lot of black coffee, which is a very American thing. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the MLOps Community Podcast. I am Dimitri Os, and I am joined by none other than Abby. What is going on, Abby? I've been recording the third intro today, so at the same time... <laughs> We're just deceiving you. <laughs> that is true. Listener, if you were wondering, we just pounded out like three different intros and we're getting pretty good at it right now. This introduction, though, we just got off the call or the recording with Tuin 
and I loved it. I really was fascinated by some of the stuff that he was talking about. Did you have any key takeaways that I can add on to? What were you, what'd you like from the conversation? Actually, when I was looking at base 10, I thought they built a platform for machine learning engineers and data engineers to not have to do the boring stuff, which is the engineering yeah. stuff. According to some people, boring stuff, especially data scientists. But it seems like he had a very different perspective, which was based on their research with a lot of Stanford students. And I liked what he said, which is eventually you have to become an engineer and you have to think about everything from very product perspective. And that is the key audience that they've been building the platform for, which is engineer first platform. Yes. I, I love how he said, I mean, this was probably the hottest take of the conversation, which was data scientists are an artifact. It was like a blip in time. And he's not sure that they're going to be around much longer or they're going to be here for in 10, 20 years. I thought that was, oof, he's going out on a limb there. But yeah, the whole conversation that we had around basically empowering the software engineers with machine learning and AI, I thought that was awesome and really liked hearing his viewpoint on it. I think the another good part for me or the highlight was going a little bit into microservices and how he thinks about using microservices to build products of the future, especially as we are working with bigger models. It has become a little bit more obvious to everybody, but for them, they were doing it before it was cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He has been at it for a while. They started in 2019. They've been plugging away and now the space that he's in just absolutely blew up. So it's good to see. I'm glad that they're finding success and I hope you all enjoy the conversation. Of course, the biggest thing for us that could help right now is if you know one person that would enjoy this episode and if you can share it with that one person, that would mean so much to us right now. I have one question for you, Demetrius. Did we get any reviews or comments oh we did oh i think we did hold on oh shoot i gotta no give me a sec i'm gonna go find them what do we got okay oh we got some awesome reviews this is cool so wait this one might be from you what is this from you did you write no. a review no no, no, no no all right i just saw the name it's from go ali ali X. Oh, okay i can't pronounce that but uh, this is the most recent review. I'm a senior ML engineer who deals a lot with ML ops related items since we don't have a dedicated role for that on our team. This show and the Slack community, in parentheses, have been great resources for inspiration and staying up to date on the constant evolution of tools and the best practices. It's very useful to hear from other practitioners as we all try and navigate this landscape together. Whoever you are, go Aliak, whatever. I get tongue-tied. Oh, that is so cool. I love seeing that. That is absolutely too kind, and I appreciate it. If you want to leave us a review, that would be super cool. It is very helpful to see this stuff, and I love reading these. That's the reviews, and it would mean the world to us if you left a review also. Share this with one person, leave a review, show us some love, and let's get into it with Tui. You've got an interesting background, dude. You were in investment banking and now you're in machine learning infrastructure. Give us the breakdown. How the hell did that happen? Yeah. I was an engineer in college. I went to work in banking, spent two years in banking, got bored out of my mind. You know, honestly, like was was uh I a lot of good, but just also just so boring. Um the I think the real positive of investment banking is that they just teach you to work very hard when you hate your life and you're not having a good time. Um, and that translates really well to when you're having a great time and you're working on interesting things. So you're like, I could work forever. It, it, it's a really interesting dynamic, right? So like every, the side note, like every, every night at 6 p.m., your director would come to you and say, I need this by... 6 a.m. tomorrow, or 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, and you'd be like, okay, cool. And so you'd stay up all night, you'd stay up all night, get the work done, and they didn't need it at 9 a.m. the next morning, but you had to do it anyway. Um, and if you do that every day for two years, 
it is one of the most horrible things, but um, where it's just like work for the sake of work. And so, but you still have to do the work. I'm assuming you're making good money, but you're just getting grinded down. Yeah. This is one common complaint people do have about finance industry as well as about law. Both do have that very similar culture, which is like, hey, make the associates work crazy hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's right. I, I, it, it, they're, they're apprenticeship businesses, right? So it's like like the, the general consensus is that you learn by doing. It's like the same as medicine as well. You know, where it's just like, we'll just work you to the ground and you know, you, you appreciate you pr- appreciate it afterwards. And then if, if, in, in a lot of ways, it actually like maintains the hierarchy of these, these professions. Cause yeah. it's like you have to do the work. It's, um, it's pretty fascinating. But I um, did that for a bit and I was just like, I don't need to do this anymore. And so I actually moved to Boston to work on some um, biomedical research using machine learning. This is like 2012, 2011. Um, um, using machine learning to predict the prognosis of uh, a neuromuscular disease. So we were trying to figure out really, really early on in someone's life um, if they were going to have, um, you know, one of these diseases and just for early intervention, um, published a few papers, um, you know, machine learning that was very different. It was very much like the support vector machine um, era, like gradient boosted trees were just becoming, were just becoming popular. Um, but really had a great time. And then, you know, just through a series of twists and turns, just kept getting deeper and deeper. You glossed over something right there real fast, which like, yeah, I was sleeping under my desk and my boss was asking me for these reports by 9 a.m. And then I just like went and did this super advanced shit with machine learning. (laughs) How did you know how to do this advanced stuff with machine learning in 2010, 2011? Yeah, so I studied signal processing in college. So I had like a like a probability background, um, and if I had I did a bit of information theory here and there. And so I think like from like a technical perspective, it wasn't you know different right. probabilities, different statistics, um, as opposed to you know something really really new. And so I I actually like spent like the last three or four months while I was at that job just learning really like relearning statistics um, in a coffee shop. On weekends, I was just like, "All right, sure, sounds good. I'll, I'll, I'll go and work at a lab for a bit. Yeah. Doesn't matter. What else am I doing? Selling my soul, or sleeping under desks. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll do, I'll oh, I'll do classic, man. That's so cool. So then you got into ML, and yeah. then you started getting really into it. I'm assuming, like, where happened then? I uh, started. So I just started working with machine learning in like a very applied sense. So worked worked on fraud detection, content moderation. The kind of like I'd say, twenty ten, early twenty tens use cases of machine learning, um, you know, lead scoring, you know, the, 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 those types of stuff. And I, I think um, eventually it went and started another company that was acquired in twenty eighteen. But like it, it was, it was pretty. It was pretty interesting because I think in twenty in twenty ten to twenty twenty, like no one really had any expectations of machine learning. And so, like, most people were just treating it like a research function for the most part, right? Even in companies, it was just like, you know, unless you were at Netflix and working on recommendations or, you know, Uber and working on, um, you know, ETA prediction and those types of things, you are going to places that were pretty underinvested. So they'll be like, oh, we have a machine learning problem. We'll just hire, we'll hire a few people. We'll hire, um, we'll hire a few people and then let's um, hope something comes out of it and you know, ultimately nothing did. But for, for me, at least, I really didn't want that to be the case. So I ended up just becoming an engineer as well to be able to support myself as a machine learning engineer. So I was like, all right, if I'm going to do ML, you know, I need to understand how to actually get this to value for someone as opposed to training a model in a Jupyter notebook um, and showing a confusion matrix to someone. Like that wasn't the, that wasn't the That's end awesome. goal at all for me and so it was very much like how do you how do you build how do you how do you get this into products that was that's so kind of like the thing that, that really happened, appealed which to is me. the transition towards ml engineering slash ml ops was this at gumroad or it was it at the next company shape yeah at gumroad um it was very much that we just didn't have the resources to have like engineering help on the ml side so the founder a guy called sahel um um was very much just like you know 
you can do whatever you want, but you're gonna have to do it by yourself. Um, and so I just did, I just figured, I, you know, I ended up learning a, a, a bunch of server side engineering, a bunch of front end engineering. We hired another machine learning guy who's a friend of mine and one of my co-founders of this business. He had a PhD in mathematics and he was just like, oh, I could train some models, should be, should, you know, should become an engineer. So he became an engineer. And so we kind of ended up with, I'd say at the time, a differentiated skill set in that we were, we are machine learning people, but we yeah. also knew how to build products. My, my journey was very similar, which is I started working as a data scientist and then it was like, hey, nobody was there to do engineering, learn everything by yourself. Somebody had to, one person on the team and yeah. then eventually everybody starts picking it up. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's like what's super interesting. We can maybe talk about this. It's just around like maybe like the last six or seven years, like last 10 years, it was about like, you know, the data scientists who became engineers. Um, and now like, I think the world, the paradigm has mm -hmm. completely shifted. And now it's like, hey, every engineer needs to learn a bit of machine learning. Um, and like what that means, we're still trying to figure it out, but we're, we're, it's flipped. And like, it's crazy. Cause like, I think this has flipped in like the last six months. It hasn't flipped in like, it, it, it flipped very, very quickly. Um, but it is a, the paradigm is just very, very different now. Um, and you know, I think, but I think that's right, which is like, you either go to a team where you have support or you figure out how to support yourself. There's no data scientist well, for the sake of data scientists. Go on. You had a hot take there that I think is awesome that I want to go back into, which is that it went from data scientists needing to learn engineering. Now it's been flipped on its head and engineers need to learn mo machine learning. Like keep going with that one. Uh, I want to pull on that thread a yeah. little more. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is fascinating. Like this is something like I've just like been thinking more and that, more about, especially with our own customers as we've seen this like develop and see who's having impact. Is that my um, take right now is that data scientists and I was one of these people. Um, and you know, like I know a lot of your listeners might be a lot of data scientists. Do. I think data scientists were a relic of the past. I think you know we it was just this like flash in time moment where. You know, we didn't know how to actually get value from machine learning. And it was like this researchy function. And so what we actually did was we're like, oh, like, and um, I think Avi um, said this too, which was like, you know, we looked at the people where we thought this stemmed out of and we're like, oh, there must be data people, you know, like the data people must do the data science. And so you'd basically have these people who are traditionally analysts go in you know, read something, they're working in R, you know, a lot of the initial machine learning libraries were in R, like a scikit-learn was a adaptation of a, a library uh, in in R. And so, you know, they, they'd go and start doing machine learning. Um, turned out like, you know, analysis and, and machine learning are actually like very, very different things. And they it just ha happened to stem out of this. And we built a whole industry for, you know, from 2012 to 2020, around supporting data people who became data scientists to to do machine learning. Um, and even the skill set, even honestly, even the product that we built three years ago was built under this premise. Um, t turns out that like there's so much more leverage. There's so much more leverage when you engineers use machine learning because they can build their own products. They can actually think about productizing it and they're not reliant on getting other people to build for them. So my take is actually what we're going to see now is that these data people who became machine learning people, I think that's actually going to shrink back. They're just going to go back to d being data people. And machine learning is going to become just like a massive, massive part of every engineer's toolkit. And I think like one, one thing that's super interesting is that, so one of, one of our uh, investors who we, Demetrius, who we met through Greylock, um, um, they have a pretty like, active recruiting effort, especially on campus. And we, we do a lot of on-campus recruiting at Stanford. And one thing we get at, like out of this is that we get like what the, like for every en software engineer who's graduating as part of the career fair, what their primary focus is. And, you know, we've been building, building this company for three and a half years now. So we have like three or four kind of data points here, like snapshots in time every May. What do the engineers know and what do they want to do? And I, I swear it's gone from like their top prior, their top focus being machine learning probably about 20% in 20, 2019 to like the, like last year, it was like, you know, 70 to 80%. I'm guessing this oh, year yeah. is going to be like 95%.
there's no doubt in my mind that this shit's going to be 95. And I think like that is just like the arc of the arc of the skill set, which is like engineers learning how to adapt these things that, you know, maybe not even having to understand like how deep do I need to go into this model, being able to choose like a black box, like taking taking something and understanding how to appropriate it as opposed to, you know, starting from scratch. Well, dude, you said a lot there. And that's, I guess, the next question is how deep do these software engineers need to go? Because that is something that I think people ask a lot in the MLOps community. And one thing that I think about is how we just had this survey, right? And it was all about people using large language models and how they're using them and what tools they're using around it. And you do see that the barrier to entry has been lowered. It's not been lowered. It's just been absolutely disintegrated. Yeah. There is no barrier. Now, if you even (laughs) can write in English, you're good. (laughs) Like you can figure this out. So one thing though is that how like how (laughs) much value you can get if you know how to go into TensorFlow and really turn some knobs and host your own like open yeah. source model and maybe bring it down. Maybe you don't need this large language model. You can just use a smaller model and train it on your data, your company data. And so maybe we could go into that a little bit on how there is a bit of a juxtaposition. It's like there is this gateway drug, which now is like GPT, and you can go into machine learning and you can get a feel for what AI can give you. And then if you want to go deeper down the rabbit hole, you can start to figure out, all right, well, how do I play around with these open source models? Yeah, I, I can start with like an anecdote, right? So like and when Dimitris, we talked about um, this guy, this project last time we talked was like this, this refusion project at the end of twenty. 20- uh, 2022 that kind of took off, which was, you know, it was based off stable diffusion and it was fine-tuned to create spectrograms. It was fine-tuned to create spectrograms. And um, and so basically what you could do, and you can still do it right now, you go to refusion.com, you can type in like, you know, Taylor Swift dancing to bo- or like making Indian music and like it'll spit out something that sounds like, you know, someone that's Taylor Swift. And like, you know, you got to use your imagination a bit. Um, the I, I I'd say that that like, to me that's like a really good example. Like that's the 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 engineer who or the engineers who built that, uh, um, you know they didn't have a ton of machine learning experience. So what like they have a lot of music experience. They have a lot of domain experience around music, and they have a lot of intuition around music creation. But they were able to more or less use the machine learning part of it as a and and like and mind you, they weren't just using the input output stuff. Like they were. They were still fine tuning it. Like they were going, and you know they had a weights and weight, weights and biases open. I don't, I don't know if they had like a deep conceptual understanding of what was happening under the hood. And, and you know, I don't mean this as a diss to them because you know I, I think like, very highly of those guys. Um, but really, like they're able to create value by thinking of it the product problem, not as much as like the research problem. And so I think we're like thankfully we've gone in from this explore to this exploit state in the last in in the last year where we've gone from like hey like the research section was the explore part and the research stuff is still happening um but we we have got the abstractions and the understanding around these models now that a lot of folks can exploit it without understanding you know how how like you know what's going on on the end you know on the 27th layer (laughs) And, you know, like, what do I need to change there? I, I, I think that's fantastic. I think, like, there's still going to be room for that um, explore that explore state. But I think you could just go really, really far. You can just go really, really far without having um, to go that deep. And, we, you know, we see this with our customers, too. It's just, like, the amount of engineers who are taking, like, Whisper or who are taking Stable Diffusion or taking ControlNet um, or taking um, Llama and, and be like, what can I do with this? Um, it's just, it's, it's astonishing. It's unlike anything I've seen before, which is like, we just kind of like, we, we built the abstraction high enough or the value was, was, was high enough that we could just try to, tre- we could finally treat yeah. these things as black boxes. If it, maybe it's I love right the word it. Cambrian explosion. That is what's happened. That is the best way of explaining 
explaining or describing what is going on right now. And when you talk about these software engineers that are now being able to exploit ML or AI, one thing that comes to yeah. my mind is how everybody's kind of on the same playing field. And so you don't really have any defensibility, it feels like. You know, I, I look at those uh, photo, you yeah. know, there was like, as soon as one person figures out that there is demand for a certain type of thing, like the profile yeah. picture generated by Stable Diffusion, then there's copycats that pop up. And so I, I wonder how you think yeah. about that. And again, should we really dive deep under the hood and figure out what is going on to try and give us a leg up on the rest of the world? Yeah. I, I think um I think I think that will still exist, right? Like I think it's like it's just like the 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 long tail of use cases will be these kind of generic commoditized businesses. Um Eric Schmidt, uh Matei Zaharia from Databricks, Eric Schmidt from Google, obviously, and um Mitra, I think Metra Ragu, um, they recently had like a, a blog post on this about, you know, how much do you think that this this GPT kind of gateway drug large language model off the shelf model service provider will be able to solve as opposed to like how much will you have to, you know, fine tune, how much will you have to go deep into? And I think like the truth is, is that for the low value, re I, I personally think, and I think this is their point um, as well, that like for the low value, you know, long tail of use cases, like the, the commoditized, the commoditized like GP, you know, GPT-4 API call, um, will will become huge, but you know, to to turn that and make this, hey, this works really good for medical for this medical imaging. Hey, this look like works really good for lawyers. Hey, this really looks uh, works really well for, um, like I don't know, design. Like I, I or like for video generate. I think you're gonna have to go deeper and and either come up with your own models and you know just or just like tune them or appropriate those models uh -huh. for your context. And I think, you know, and like, I think there's, there is a case for like smaller, more potent targeted models there, as opposed to this general purpose, I do everything, I do everything model. Um, I'm kind of like against Pan-Asian restaurants because like, you know, it's like you, I, I don't think you can make Thai food and Japanese food um, equally good. I think when you do want to get the best when you do want to get the best Thai food, you'll still go to a Thai restaurant. You want to go to that that restaurant that makes Thai food, Japanese food, and you know Chinese food. And there is something I think that is. It's been you've opened up a door in my mind. It's like there's so many different use cases out there that even if we try, the majority of people that are hacking around on stuff are not going to find those little use cases. And that is where the long tail is. And for those use cases, for the most part, a GPT is going to be good enough because there's not so yep. many people searching around in that part of the universe. Yep. But then when you go to the use cases that have these huge unlocks, like you were talking about, like doing stuff for lawyers or for medical imaging, et cetera, et cetera, that's where you need to really add a lot more value than what you can just get off the shelf. Yeah, I, I think so. I think when you need concentrated concentrated value and you care about speed, cost, and performance, which is like the the, the holy trifecta, you're going to have to go smaller, more targeted. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the core idea that everybody is talking about right now, which is how potent would the generalized models be in the long run? while it would be great at, you know, giving you some sort of abstraction initially and solving problems at that level. Past that, we have to think of different things, which is, are we using another model and using it in like an actor critic setting where we are able to see, first is to be able to set the guardrails for the results generated from these models. And yep. the second is the question around when to do prompting versus when to do fine tuning and what is the general kind of practice around knowledge distillation yeah i, I think that's right that, that 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 seems right to me which is that you know you're gonna the like you, the first the, the first question you're gonna almost make is like 
is there an objective truth here and will I, will I be able to, you know, I, this is like, I think, uh, um, De Dennis from Meme AI, I don't know if you guys have seen Meme AI, it's a, it's a cool company. Um, um, they, and you, you should have Dennis on the show cause I think he, he thinks about this in terms of product, like really, really, um, you know, neat. Yeah, that's awesome. But one thing he thinks is just like, you know, if there is a task to be done, like if there is a specialized task to be done, um, the general stuff will break down for a number of reasons. And then you almost have the secondary question is like, what do I need to do to solve this? And it might be better prompting. It might be fine tuning. It might be a completely different model. Maybe it's, maybe like you need this response within a hundred milliseconds and you need to, and you don't want it to be very, very expensive because it's happening you know, every three or four seconds. And like, you're going to have to get a smaller, more concentrated model. But I, I think, I think, that at least to me intuitively that that seems right i think like you know like we can i can just say it because i think it's true at, on some degree as well it's like open AI models are re really good right now they're like scary good they're like scary better you know than even like the more targeted stuff right now and i think like there's a bit of catch up that needs to happen right now um for the things that we are talking about to be true um i think you know we like but intuitively it does make sense to me i think i agree with you which is these are all the limitations of llms and you know because again you know you don't have the backtracking accessibility that we did have in the conventional models but let's move a little bit towards the compute which is the bigger elephant in the room any model that you're deploying now that yeah. the fact that we've already proven in a way that bigger models might be a little bit better, not like trillion parameters, but yeah. just a just tiny bit bigger than we're using today could have better performances. So I wanna yeah. you had a very interesting blog post, which is how to choose the right horizontal scaling setup for high traffic models. I want, I want you to sure, talk a yeah. little bit more about in terms of the context, because as you scale, both the things increase, which is the compute as well as the storage. Yeah, t totally. Um, I, I didn't write that blog post. I think it was written by someone um, else on our team. Um, but um, I, I, I think like th what what you're saying is, is like 100% true, right? Which is like the, as these models get, as these models get bigger, they... And yeah, this is this is a great plug for our company because it's the basis for our, for our company, which is that you know a whole host of infrastructure problems um, show up, and so you know whether that be you know right now we're trying to deploy a you know I think it's like a sixty billion parameter sixty bi uh, billion parameter model with like floating point thirty two FP thirty two or something like that, which is you know huge, and I think like the 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 challenges from like a scaling perspective, from a scale to zero perspective, from a cost perspective, from a um, latency perspective, um, from a scale up scale up perspective, like there's all these like, you know there's all these massive um, barriers that that you know stop you from using these models in some setting to build really really great products, um, and I don't and I and I think. Um, you're right. I'd be like, this stuff is unsolved. Like now, th now we're getting into territory where, you know, like when Llama came out like four weeks ago or whatever, like we were the first people to be able to serve that efficient, like, you know, really, really fast. We created this chat Llama thing. If you go to chatllama.com, um, you know, you could, you could play around with it. And, you know, it got to the top, it was at the top of Hacker News, you know, for most of the day. And what you realize is that, you know, these models now that are bigger and like I think at least the current understanding is is that the 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 bigger models are performing better than the smaller more specialized models um you you you're talking about deploying things that or serving things at, at um in a way that'd be hard to serve in the past but now and like because the lot lar the largest use case is almost like a consumer use case right now is at like a scale that we haven't thought about um and I, and I think, you know, again, a lot of these things are, I'd say from an MLOps perspective and from an infrastructure perspective, like they'd be on my pay grade and I, I couldn't tell you how we're doing it, but you know, we are, you know, there are lots of interesting things that we're doing from like a scale to zero perspective, from like a, um, auto scale perspective, from a cold start perspective, like how, um, like when, when I, when my 
if I have this massive model and I only needed two hours a day, do I need to have it running all day long? And when it, when it scales down, how long will it take for it to come back up? What's acceptable? And I think these are all the unsolved challenges into getting these, getting these. And, and like, this is, I think, what OpenAI just so clear has done so well. Like, you know, like, is that, you know, not only, they made their models usable. Like, they didn't just create the best model. They made it usable. They gave you fine-tuning infrastructure. They gave you serving infrastructure. They gave you great docs. Um, you don't have to think about scale up and scale down. Um, you know, I don't think the rest of us, and us included, and, you know, um, a bunch of other products, like, we, have, we haven't created that same moment of magic for engineers just yet to be able to use these models very, very effectively yeah, and efficiently. Yeah, and another, one of the bigger challenges that has been persistent in all our conversation with different ML engineers as well as data scientists is documentation. How frequently do you document your code? Um, and how do you document your models as well? And yes, there are options, which is version controlling and model container versionizations. Uh, so yeah. those all options are there, but you have something interesting, yeah. which is docs as code. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that as well and tell us what it is about? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a t totally. Which is like, what one thing we've thought a lot about is, you know, um, how do we maintain a, a product that has like active living documents that all engineers can contribute to? Um, and so we, we, you know, we, we thought, we thought a lot about, you know, being able to create um, be, you know, creating some scaffolding so that engineers could write one, like docs as code. So it's, it's hosted in, in a, in a general purpose, um, documentation system that you're, you're contributing as code, but it's also integrated with the development process. Um, and I, and I think like, you know, Philip and I both, it's funny, both of those posts, I think you talked about were written by, were written by Philip. He's very, very passionate about this, which is like, how do you build docs, um, into the life cycle of of engineering, I think this is even more true from like a from like a machine learning perspective, right? Because these artifacts they kind of disappear. They kind of have these moments of time, and uh, who knows what my who knows what my um, what my model was four weeks ago on you know my third laptop at at work, um, and like how, how do you, like we, and we we haven't solved this yet. And I think anyone's done a good job here, but like. That documentation pers perspective and that version management perspective is definitely a massive open problem in machine learning, um, still. And like uh, the stuff you're referencing, Abby, is very much from like just our engineering workflow perspective, um, as opposed to within our product. And I think like that's something we, we hear a lot from customers, which is, you know, I had a machine learning researcher or engineer, they came and trained a model, they disappeared. You know, what does that version do? Which version matters? You know, how do I find the other? I, I'm sure you guys talk about, you know, you guys hear about so this from, much. You know, uh, yeah. from, from, the, oh from the community as well, which is like, um, and, you know, and, and like there's stuff like weights and biases, which is making it easy from a training perspective. But still, like, I don't think most customers of ours and, you know, um, or that we talk to and most folks that you talk to would be able to tell you, like, which artifact is running in production. Um, I, 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 I think it's, you and, know, I mean, yeah. another thing which I found interesting looking at base 10 is I feel like you guys are an advocate for microservice based architecture. And I don't know if that's across the stack yeah. or just across the models itself, because across the models, I feel like you're ahead of your type. Reason being because now with LLMs, now everything is, you have products built up on top of APIs. Yeah, I, I think with everything. I think we think that like, you know, so like w base 10 at its core is this way for, you know, it's I, like the way I like to think of it, it's like a toolkit for um, creating value from your models. And like, you know, w like I think like the a good analogy there is something like Vercel, which Vercel took your like front end package and they said, hey, we're just going to build a bunch of utilities and extend it from that to the real world. Um I think for us, like it goes from like all the model stuff definitely de has to be API based. And, you know, like it's everything needs to be a microservice. Like we, we, not only does that model, um, that model, um, itself and every single version have to have its own API, but the logging for it has to have an API so you can access the logs for it. I think, you know, the, the, the place where this gets super interesting is that we also have these serverless functions that you can write on top of your model. So think about your traditional 
like I'll take you back to like one use case. There's like one user has this massive large language model, gets hit a lot. Um, they're trying to do some performance optimization, so they need to build a caching layer on top of it. Very, very typical product thing. Like, where are you going to build that? Well, you can go and build that in your own mono repo somewhere, but Basecamp gives you a serverless function and access to a database, so you can build that caching layer into Base 10. But those serverless functions that do the caching and call the model, they have their own APIs as well. And, and like by separating these concerns, we can scale up differently. So like maybe your your model actually needs a lot less traffic uh, for a lot less traffic than your overall service. Maybe vice versa. But it gives the 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 user a lot more control over how this this model will be used in the application and business. And one of the things I was concerned about when we say, hey, we're going to advocate for microservices or API based solution across the entire stack is how do they scale? Because microservices, yeah. again, do have their own limitations. If you have too many APIs versus, yeah. you know, testing in production becomes a little bit more complex. Second thing is it just increases operational complexity. Yeah. Uh, managing data consistency is another issue. How do you work past those challenges? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that these are pretty challenging, but like, I think you just got to treat it just like, um, you would with a, it's like a traditional API, right? Which is that you know it's you have you have your CI CD system. You have you know like what one thing that we don't do now that we are m working towards is to have a much more Git based workflow. It's like you know you you don't ever think when you have a when your web app is running, um, the user never has to think about hey what version is running, right? It's just one it's just one URL, and then behind the scenes they give you access to what. You know what is what that is pointing to, I think that's what we're trying to get to as well. Which is like, you know, you have versions on your model, but there's only one primary version, and that is the thing that gets used by everything else. If you want to call another version, that still works, but you need to keep track of what is primary and what is the the main version. I think the same thing um, with what we call workloads or serverless functions is just like there is a production version and there's like everything else. Um, and they by by maintaining this bifurcation, this, um, you know, this separation between what is being served live traffic by your app and what is not. I think you can get around those things, but I think this is also one of the benefits of having engineers as the primary archetype now, right? Because th these are the workflows that they're used to. They're used to, you know, CI/CD. They're used to maintaining the production version and everything else. They, uh, they understand these like very traditional Git-based workflows, um, staging, production, you know, master, whatnot. So yeah, like I, I think I think it, it, I think it's reducing it more into an engineering problem Dude. than a data science problem. It's like what I would say to that, which is the complexity. That Dude, I mean, just think about how many times, I just know because over the last three years, it's been like, so many engineers and even like ex data scientists or some people even brand themselves as recovering data scientists they talk about how painful it is to get some of their teammates just to learn git and hopefully yeah. that isn't going to be the problem anymore hopefully we're not going to have to figure these things out or push data scientists to do those things that they don't want to do because they're just going to get eaten by the software engineering world yeah I hope I, I I maybe not. I think it's a it's an evolution that simplifies things a lot more. Um, in that it's you know, and like I I think like you know, I, I, Abby, you mentioned this earlier as well, which is that you know you will you and I and I said too, it's like you know we found ourselves to be more effective when we became engineers and had to learn that. It's like I don't think it's a bad thing that you know you have you know really clean workflows around this, and I think by that by the persona being kind of like squashed a bit into, hey, you are a, you are also an engineer and your machine learning is one of the things you know. I think that is like a, it does make life a bit easier, mm. um, holistically at least. All right, man, I want to switch gears and I have to ask because I love the fact that you have some incredible people that have backed Base 10. How did that happen? I mean, did they just see in you this shining star and they wanted to go deeper or what? Like, uh, are you incredibly well connected or are you a great salesman or a little bit of everything? No. So I, I think like at the end of the day, like um, 
we we we've just been around for a while, and so we 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 have meaningful connections. And like you know, some of the people we've raised money for, you know, we've known for you know honestly close to a decade. Like Sarah Cyril Guo from Greylock Now Conviction, who you know has written a number of checks into us. Like we we started we we met her when we were at our first company in 2015, and then she backed us in 2019. And so it was just like a lot of relationship building. I think though, like overall. Like for us, like what we got lucky with was that we were a pretty technical team that w- that could build products. Um, you know, we were we were working in a market that had a lot of oxygen. We were working in a market that had a lot of oxygen, and you know, of course, like we just knew we just been around long enough that we knew um, a lot of great people who showed early conviction um, in us. I don't think there's like you know anything particularly special about us like this this stuff's very very difficult mm. this stuff's very very difficult and i think you've got to get lucky at you know a number of different of you know junction junctions and so i i love the humility where he says i've got no secret sauce it's just timing <laughs> it's just perfect timing <laughs> nothing else exactly that's that right place right time you i was at the right coffee shop at the right time <laughs> you know, ordering the right thing. Well, and you're working, exactly, you're working on a hard problem. And the problem got very yeah, popular. Yeah, on a hard problem. The, the problem got prob- popular. And I, and I think, like, there was, like, a, you know, you guys, you guys, like, remember this, like, three years ago, two years ago, is that, you know, there was so many machine learning ops companies and so many of them, and still are, like, we're just so enterprise-focused. For sure. And we're just like, hey, we're going to sell the enterprise. We're going to go top down. We're going to sell it to the CIO. Um, I, I'd say that, you know, there was like a, a small set of companies that were focused on the end user and like, you know, building for the engineer or the data scientist. And, you know, ob- obviously, um, and like, I think those are, to me at least, they're the I- interesting companies. And, you know, where I, I, like all these companies, not even talking about Base 10 right now, fantastic, right? Like Hugging Base is a great company. It was building for the end mm-hmm. user replicate and all those um guys with like ben and um like awesome people working on really interesting problems with a differentiated point of view but i think for us like you know we were we were thinking about machine learning from a product perspective and we have been and we continue to be you know we haven't really made we still have a long way to go obviously we're, we're just getting started but um the like it it is it is somewhat uh it was somewhat different at the time and you know you see like um now companies like that are definitely getting funded right or making a lot of splash like you know lang chance is doing so great right now it's fantastic mm-hmm. to see but again it's focused on the engineer it's focused on the it's focused on using ml as an api almost yeah 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 well tell us about i mean i know you guys are hiring and who are you looking for you're looking yeah. for machine learning engineers yeah exactly so we're looking for you know folks who could do ml we're looking for um, honestly, like machine learning infer is, you know, this is why your podcast is so great and your audience is so great and your community is so fantastic is that like, there's just not that many ML for people out there who are really good. Um, and I think like that, this is like such a massive opportunity. That's why it's so hard for us to hire them. So any ML for people, like, you know, we will value you, you will, you have a good time. You're working hard problems. Um, we'd love to chat. Um, you know, but I think in general, you know, we, we take a pretty, um, what's the right way? Like we, we look for more utility players than specialists uh, um, at base 10. And so like, you know, if you like to build stuff, you like to like, you know, reach out to me or anyone else on the team, we'd love to chat. We're pretty open-minded um, about who we bring yeah, on. And we'll leave a link to the job description and the hiring page and the description of this, yep. uh, of this podcast in case anyone wants to check also, it out. Also, maybe one quick thing I'll ask as a follow-up on that. Are you hiring like in a particular location as well? Or is it across states? It's, any, it's anywhere, you know, it, it, it's the states. It's, you know, we, we have a team and we have people in Canada. We have people in Armenia. You know, we have people in the US. Um, like we're, we're pretty open on location. So nice. building remote teams is hard, but we're committed to it. Yeah. Well, dude, I got one last question for you, and hopefully this doesn't destroy our relationship. But first time we talked, you told me that what yeah. you were born, you were born in India, or you were born in Australia. I can't remember exactly. 
I was, bo- I was born in Australia. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then that destroys the question that I was going to ask. I was going to ask if you were... Well, you should ask it Ask it anyway. No, I was going to ask if you were the guy that that movie was based on, Lion. <laughs> Lion. Um... <laughs> oh, he was born in India. No, I, I, I wish. That, 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 that's a good story. No, do I wish? I don't think no. I wish. That's, I, uh, but... Oh, it's a good movie. That was a great good, movie. Good, good movie. Yeah. I was just thinking while I was yeah. talking to you, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, the Aussie accent is coming through, and so I had to ask. Anyway, this has been awesome, man. I appreciate you coming yeah. on here. I appreciate you chopping it up with us and teaching us a few things. It's always a pleasure chatting with you, and I look forward to doing it more. Awesome. Thank you so much for the time, Abby and Demetrius.